I've had work coming in from people that I worked with 10 years ago because you, you remember those relationships and being on LinkedIn and it, LinkedIn is hard, but posting, being relevant, you know, having an opinion and having an opinion is hard online because there are people that will disagree with that opinion. So yeah. being, prepared, being prepared for that. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Privacy Pros Academy podcast. My name is Jamila, and I'm a data privacy analyst at Kazian Privacy Experts. I'm primarily responsible for conducting research on current and upcoming legislation, as well as any key developments. My co-host today is Jamal Ahmed, who is a fellow of information privacy and the CEO at Kazian Privacy Experts. He is a leading global privacy professional, world-class trainer, and lead mentor at the Privacy Pros Academy. Welcome, Jamal. Hi, Jamila. Great to be back for another episode. Yeah, I'm very excited and I will introduce our guest today. Our guest today is Richard Merigold, a highly experienced data protection practitioner. Richard has spent over 10 years supporting organizations across healthcare, pharmaceutical, technology, charity and financial service sectors. He is also a regular speaker and commentator on data protection and privacy matters and holds the BCS certificate in data protection. Richard is co-founder of iStorm, a market-leading consultancy and advisory service provider, which specializes in providing data protection, information security, and penetration testing consultancy and support services to a wide range of organizations across the UK and Europe. Wow, what a biography. Welcome, Richard. I think it was easier to read when I wrote it. Now (laughs) (laughs) Now this feels really long. (laughs) <laughs> thank you thank you for joining us today I'm looking forward to speaking with you thank you for having me uh so on our podcast as you know we always start with an icebreaker question uh so today's is what is the best gift you've ever received wow that's a really good question um when I when, when my daughter was first born obviously we were in the office a lot when people used to wear shirts to work <laughs> and suits to work and the shirt I started by, I always used to have these little brass collar pins. Yeah. And eventually you to lose them. And I got a pair of uh, sterling silver collar pins engraved with, um, uh, I think it was kisses, bubbles and kisses for daddy, lots of love, Millie. So that's Aww. Really that's, really nice. that's a really sweet gift. That's a nice one. And But no more shirts in the office anymore. <laughs> no, I, I, try, I try to, if I have a, a you know, a, a new client meeting or something, and I'd always try and put a shirt on. But yeah, if I can, if I can get away with living in a t-shirt and hoodie, then that's that's where I am these days. I think most people have done that, especially in the past year now, working from home. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's probably one of the perks of being your own boss, Richard. Eh? You can wear whatever you like. Well, that's the other thing, isn't it? It's you know, creating a culture of um, you know, being who you want to be and, and being comfortable with who you are, and then you know, it just felt daft coming to work in a in a suit when you know you don't think you need to be in a suit to be able to, to do your job you know there are certain times when a, when a shirt and tie is, is is required but yeah a lot of the time just be comfortable is is the best way to be definitely definitely uh so on to the questions and what first sparked your interest in data privacy wow so i've been in in the industry for about 12 years now i think i worked out the other day um and my route in definitely wasn't um it wasn't fairy tale shall we say yeah so the, the company i was working in was a was a private healthcare company i'd gone for some sort of team leader type roles um and just didn't didn't get and didn't didn't fit that sort of sort of profile and at the time, there was a, an information governance manager who was, who was looking after RC 2701 and the, the data protection and uh, information governance side of the, of the business. And she wanted an assistant. I wanted a promotion. Yeah. <laughs> so I, you know, I just, it sounded interesting. I went for the job. Um, and that's, that's where it all started, really. Um, and then from then on in, I've, only ever moved in jobs either within information governance or, or data protection. Yeah. Um, and the more I did it, the, the more I found it fascinating, the more I enjoyed it. I enjoy research. I enjoy understanding legislation. I enjoy um, being able to, to practice something that makes a difference for people um, and could potentially make a difference for business. And then 
at this point now it's I like dispelling the myths I like mm -hmm. seeing people understand it more and understand data protection and, and privacy more um, and just have a better feel about it and not be scared of it and understand that it's a business benefit not a business burden yeah. so that's kind of the, the journey where we are today and do you think that understanding has uh, increased since the GDPR was that kind of the turning point I think the, the GDPR helped because the GDPR brought it in, in front of people it gave it it gave it a focus it gave um it pushed it out into into the wider world so it took it from the from the back rooms of um the NHS and and medical companies and pharma companies and it and it put it on a more uh, commercial standing but I think what's what's really changed it is things like this like podcasts the content that now goes out on LinkedIn yeah. networking sessions events there was no events when I started they mm -hmm. you know there was, there was nothing now you've you've got numerous events covering all different different sectors yeah I think all of those things is what's raising awareness it's that that constant churn of you know bringing it to the fore and, and pushing it in front of people so yeah the gdpr definitely kick-started that but i think the work that the industry has done to push itself forward mm -hmm. has to be you know it has to be applauded yeah yeah, yeah absolutely and i think one thing i've uh, certainly noticed is that uh, the media is actually more interested in publishing um, news to do with data privacy data protection data breaches um, a few years ago, none of this stuff would ever make the news unless it was like a massive breach from a massive company. But now they're reporting on all sorts of things. They're even reporting on new legislation that's being proposed and coming in. And a few years ago, this, this wouldn't have even uh, passed. Uh, no one would have opened an email with something like that on it. So it, it, there's definitely a shift in the consumer. And I think a lot of people are saying 2021 is the year that data privacy really comes to the fore. What's your thoughts on that, Richard? Do you know what I think? lockdown for for all the all the all the bad sides of lockdown there were some good things that that came out of it um and it did it, it piqued people's interest you know, a lot of stuff happened a lot of people suddenly went to, to work from home the the security aspect of working from home you know piqued people's interest i saw articles you know sort of articles you're talking about where organizations were talking about monitoring people's webcams to see whether they were sat at their desk, how long they were sat at their desk, how efficient they were, how long have you spent in the toilet? And when, you, when you're when you talking about that, that becomes personal to people and people, you know, oh, yeah, that, could have, that could have been me. That could have been me sat at my desk. Like, would I want to work for a company like that? Why is it fair that that company can can do that? Or I wonder what kind of monitoring happens in in my business. And that's where, you know, personal, you know data protection and privacy is such a, a personally associated thing. Like until you get that that little bit in somebody's mind where they go, actually, that could be me, they don't necessarily buy it. And I think lockdown has has given people that insight that this is this is real. This is about this is about you, this is about your life, this is about your information. Mm. And now people have got a lot of drive. You know, there wasn't a lot you could do last year, but you know, there's now opportunity this year to to do stuff. The world is getting back to normal. And I think everybody just feels reinvigorated. There seems to be a good vibe out in the world. You know, I think people are interested and excited to to explore and do new things. So, yeah, I think I think twenty twenty one is going to be going to be big for data protection. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, just looking at some of the opportunities on the job boards, um, and when people are announcing that they've been hired on LinkedIn, I, I've not seen a busier sector than data privacy. I, I remember a few years back, people used to have a privacy or a data protection role as. 25% or 50% or even 20% of the work they used to do. But now businesses and organizations worldwide are actually building teams of people who are working 100% of data privacy and data protection. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just huge, the opportunities out there. And I think it's only going to continue to grow because from the conversations I've had with industry leaders is they're always asking for good people. Can I recommend someone for their organization? Is it a consultant I can push forward for their project? And um, Unfortunately, the problem is there is more demand than there is supply right now, which is also a great thing uh, for, for people coming into the market. What have you noticed in terms of the job market when it comes to data privacy, uh, Richard? So, you know, we're going back to what we in 2020, 2021. So you go back to 2008, 2009, when I you know, took, took that the first job. They, they came to us and they said, we're going to make people redundant. 
you know, and you're in part of that team that's going to be made redundant. And the day they told me that they were going to do that, I went straight on the jobs board. I was like, there's, there's going to be a job out there. Let me have a look. There were information governance roles in the NHS. And there was a, and that was it. Yeah, there may have been like one high level data protection job in, in, a, in London, but that was it. Mm. And it was that day that I found my second job. And two years after that, again, I decided it was time to move on. But I, again, I've been headhunted. Somebody rang me out and said, I've got an opportunity. And it was so specialist that you were, you were hunting for one person, for one, for one company. It was always that, that kind of transient. Whereas you know, now you do go and look on the job boards and whether you're looking for a privy, privacy analyst role like that, that Jamil is undertaking, whether you're looking for a data protection manager, whether you're looking for a, an outright DPO, there's a whole wealth of, of opportunity and jobs out there. Are they paying the right salaries? It's debatable, but you know, nobody really understands the market yet. You know, there's a lot of balancing to be done. Mm. But in terms of opportunity for people wanting to get into the industry and, and wanting a job in this industry, there's never, ever been a better time. You know, the, the jobs are there. You just have to find the one that, that suits you. And as someone who hires in the sector, what kind of characteristics, what kind of traits do you look for in, in someone who's develop, trying to develop a career in data privacy? Do you know what? There's there's no um, there's no sort of set set template for somebody to be a DPO for somebody to ever to look for a, a career in privacy. There's every every sector is different. So you know you've got banking, you've got retail, you've got manufacturing, you've got you've got healthcare you've got the more marketing side of things and each sector has a risk appetite. So public sector tends to be very risk averse. They're very clear. You know, they're very black and white financial services. Again, tends to be quite risk averse. Then you move into some of the more commercial sectors like retail. You tend to be a, you know, a bit more flexible. People tend to be, a, a, you know, have a, a better view on, on commercial risk. So it really depends on the sector that you want to work in and your, and your mindset. People that, that come and work for, for us here at iStorm and the clients that we have, we always look for people that are pragmatic. So people that can look at a problem, people that can look at an issue and say, All right, that's probably not the best way to do it. But it's not a no, it's just we need to find another way. Yeah. You know, there has to be a different way. People that can work with our clients to understand their needs, understand their risk appetite, so self-starters, people with a, um, a risk background or an operational background that understand the need for compliance, but also understand the need that businesses do need, do need to make money. But then there are roles and there, you know, there, are, there are jobs out there that, that need a very clear black and white compliance-based focus. And that's much more aligned to, um, you know, to a privacy lawyer or a data protection lawyer you know, that, that can clearly pinpoint this is the exact things by law that you need to do this is what's happened in case law this is the potential impact on on your organization but if you're enthusiastic if you've got good people skills so you're good at talking to people you know and you're you're confident and you can stand by the things that that you say then this is definitely a career for you because you have to be prepared to be challenged and you will be challenged <laughs> by a lot, a lot of people and a lot of departments so you have to be able to back up your arguments. Um, but you you also have to be able to engage people. You have to be able to, to get in front of people, get buy-in, explain the benefits of, of what you're trying to do, because this is a cost. You know, there's no cost benefit to, to, to having somebody like me come into your business. There's potential long-term cultural benefit, a potential long-term um, consumer benefit and customer benefit. But I, I'm not going to save you money. You know, I'm not going to make any efficiencies i'm not going to make necessarily your your business more profitable but i'm going to create a culture and create an organization that's potentially safer more profitable in the long term so being able to persuade people is a, is a really good trait in in, a, in being a, a dpo and being a in a, being a privacy person um and having an analytical mind you know and for your old manner being able to understand legislation what does that mean what does that mean for my clients who does that need to be pointed to and being able to articulate that in a fashion that somebody can understand all those kind of things so it's it doesn't fit one person it fits a whole load of people and that's why if you look at the people on linkedin like you 
look at the people that, that, that we follow, look at the people that follow us, look at the people that are commenting. Everybody's different. Yeah. Everybody's got a different viewpoint. Everybody's got a different touch on the world. And that's what makes it, I'll <laughs> get a bit excited, but that's what makes it a really, really fascinating industry to work in. Like it's literally open to anybody. Yeah, and I think that helps kind of dispel some of the myths that it's only for people who've got background in law that can go into, into data privacy as, exactly. as well. Um, so what is your favourite thing? What do you love most about working in data privacy? It's going to sound really cheesy, and I, don't, <laughs> and I don't want it to, but it will sound really cheesy, but it's the, the people. So yeah. when I started this job 10 years ago, 12 years ago, there was no one to talk to in the you know I don't, I don't want the violin to play or anything but you know there, there wasn't there was there was nobody to bounce ideas off there was nobody to um to sort of support you and i found a group of people down in london i think called the, the data protection forum down in london and they was that was the first time and i had been in the industry five years before i found them and that was the first time that i found a group of people that understood data protection and it was you know, very, very senior people, very knowledgeable people that had been working in data protection for a very long time. You know, these people were policy writers, you know, they were um, political advisors. And that's where I started to realise that actually there's, there's potentially people that, you know, that we can liaise with here. But it's been the last two or three years that the industry has grown so much and people have come in. I've met some absolutely fantastic people. If I have a query, if I have a concern, if I'm even questioning myself, thinking, am I, am I missing something here? That I know there's a wealth of people out there that I can go to. There's support groups, there's networks, there's Slack groups, there's networking sites, there's activities like this, podcasts that you can watch and get other people's viewpoints. And that's probably my favourite thing about the industry. The, the ecosystem is fantastic. The people are fantastic. Everybody's got each other's back. And I don't think you get that in a lot of industries. Um, yeah. And that's, and that's, you know, for me, hands down, that is probably my favourite thing about this job. Yeah, I agree. I mean, when if you look at the state of the IAPP uh, back in 2008, 2000, I think they had like, what, 6,000? Maybe they had about 20,000 members. But if you look at it today, there's like 60,000 members. There's a knowledge net chapter opening up nearly every other month. And there's so many events and webinars and there's so many other um, networking opportunities. I know you're uh, putting together some um, group sessions um, coming up towards the end of this month as well. So there's so many great opportunities and so many opportunities to really speak to other industry experts and get to know their views. Because the way you look at something from one lens is going to be completely different to how another uh, person looks at it, depending on the industry and the sector they're in. And it's always fascinating, I find, to say, I can't believe I haven't even thought about that in that way. Sometimes it just seems a bit daft. Um, like, that's so simple. Why didn't I think of that? But that that's the benefit of having all these great people around. And I think one of the great things that you say about the people in the industry is everyone is so open and willing to help. I mean, you can think about some industries where people kind of want to keep their cards very close to the chest and they don't really want you to know what they think or what they're up to and they want you to kind of fall over. Whereas... In data privacy, what I found is people are more than happy to offer um, as much advice and guidance as they can to really see you do well. You're right. We've, we started a thing called the privacy space, which is essentially a, a, an online video networking environment where nothing is recorded. You know, we, we don't record the chats and people just turn up to ask questions. You know, they've struggled with something in their job today or you know, they've had a particular query and, and somebody's debating with them and... And they're looking for you know to back up their own argument, and people just come in and and have a chat and shoot the breeze, and and everybody's there to either go, oh, no, see what you've probably missed is this, or no, hundred percent, like you should say, you know, why don't you try taking this approach or listing listing these things? You know, we're in an industry at the minute whereby I have other consultants, you know, we're different, we run a business, but independent consultants ring me up and say, I can't do this work, I am too busy. Like, are you interested? Do you know anyone that can do it? You know, I have people that come to us for things like training. Like, we don't really do training. It's just never been a thing that we do. I'm like, but don't worry, I know some people that can do it for you. you know, and we'll go and pass that business around. And everybody's, you know, everybody's got everybody's, everybody's back. And I, I don't think you see that in a lot of, in a, you know, in a lot of industries anymore. Um, and I hope it continues. 
I hope it does. I hope it's not just like a, a utopia and then it's just all going to be going to explode and everybody's going to kick off. Um, but yeah, at the minute, it's it's a really really good place to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, so as we heard from your bio, you know, you've got you've got a lot of experience in the sector and um, over ten years supporting different organisations. But what's been the most memorable moment of your career so far? Probably my. You know what? In in house, it was the the day that they gave me formal responsibility for all the countries that, that the company was, was in. So France, Italy, Spain, um, the U S all of the UK businesses. And I became, uh, the director of group data protection for, for a FTSE 100 financial services company. And at that point, like I, I'd landed, I was fully in charge of, of all of the compliance programs. I rolled out the entire GDPR program. I created a, a worldwide privacy framework that remained in that in that organization today and then the second thing is 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 starting this business you know starting iStorm and being able to say i'm now comfortable to take that knowledge and take that experience and i think i can do something with it and i think i can do something for me um so yeah, then then starting this business would, would would definitely be the next big thing. Congratulations on uh, setting up your own business, um, Richard. When did you start iStorm, and what was the kind of thought process to go from where you was this uh, super successful director, <laughs> one hundred company, to then say, you know what, I'm going to go and do my own thing? So it, it had got to the point. I was very very fortunate. Um, I had a, had an amazing boss. I had a, a an amazing team in the in the job that I was in. Um, you know, I had free reign to do to do whatever I wanted I was I was traveling all over the all over the place but I felt that I'd done as much as I could do my my career had been based on building privacy frameworks from the ground up building programs you know, bringing organizations up to compliance and I felt like I didn't want to start that again I didn't want to go somewhere else and, and do that process again I felt like I'd done it um so I thought well I'm interested in doing some consultancy. You know, maybe I'll go and do 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 contracting. And my old friend from school, my mom, um, my my best friend, had rang me up, and he was working for a, a very well known um, training and and consultancy services provider as a salesman. He said, "I'm you know not enjoying this anymore. I want to go and set up on my own. I want to do something. What are you doing?" So well, I don't know. I'm going to go and be a consultant. He's like, "Well, why be a consultant? Like I'll sell, you deliver." I thought, well, hang on a minute. Like, how long is it going to take you to finish selling? And then all of my time is taken. And what are you going to do? Like, no, no, we'll make a business. You know, we'll, we'll have consultants. We'll have more people. Um, so that's that's where it started from. It was it was two people who thought that the industry was was lacking in good customer service. And there was a lot of snake oil being sold. There's a lot of fear mongering going on. And we didn't like it. And we thought we could... You know, we thought we could do a better job and we thought we could do something different. Um, so we thought, why not? Let's give it a bash. If worst case scenario, it all falls apart and you just go and get a job. You know, that's yeah. that's kind of what it comes down to. You just go back to, you know, you just go back to what you know. Um, but yeah, we, we close our three, uh, so we would have been in business for, for three years uh, in June, end of June. So yeah, it's uh, it's been a good journey. What's been the highlight of the uh, journey throughout the last three years? Oddly, the, the, the highlight has been um, lockdown, which is a, bit, a weird thing to say. So, like, like bear with me. So, we we went into lockdown um, just just the two of us, just just me and my business partner. There was originally, you know, we, we'd had a couple of people working for us. Things hadn't worked out for for whatever reasons. We went into lockdown not knowing that lockdown was coming just the two of us we we just passed up on an office we decided it wasn't time so everything kind of fell into place we came out of lockdown so as of two weeks ago there's seven of us so there's seven of us full-time in the business we have a, a network of about 10 associate consultants that support us across a range of products from pen testing to cyber security consultancy 27,001 data protection we're on target to hit our um second year financial forecast in in june of this year and that was all done despite what was going on in the, in the world last year we've been very 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 fortunate and we are um very conscious of of that um 
but yeah, we managed to to, to grow a business during that period, and, and that is it, it's hard to talk about because you don't want to be to be celebrating when a lot of people suffered. But at the same time, it's we're very proud that you know that we didn't fall apart. You know, we'd been in business a year. You know, we we didn't know what we were going to do, so we spent a couple of months just trying to work it out, and um, and then we thought, no, let's let's crack on, let's do something. Um, and we've been very, very fortunate that, that, that we've come out the, the other side in a, in a very good position. So, yeah, that's definitely the highlight so far. Yeah, congratulations on that massive uh, growth. It's amazing. Thank you very much. What kind of advice would you give to someone who was thinking about taking the same leap from moving through being an employee to, to consultant? Don't do it. So, <laughs> so tired. <laughs> um, it's you know we, we 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 talk to a lot of people so there's um you know, there's a lot of people on uh, uh, other DPAs on Slack groups and things like that and people people often ask that exact question like what do you do how do you do it and the first thing is you have to network like you have never networked before everybody you've ever worked with everybody you've ever come into contact with is a potential customer mm-hmm. you know, get in touch with those people. Don't try and sell to them, but remind them who you are. Tell them that maybe this is something you're considering. You know, maybe you're going to move into consultancy. You know, have they got any advice? Have they got any business? Is there anything you might be able to do to do for them? Um, I was very fortunate. I'd managed. I was able to um, leave my 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 current role and then be brought straight back on the Monday. To, mm-hmm. to fill in the gap while they essentially replaced me so we were very very fortunate in that respect. Yeah. I had a long-term engagement straight off the bat but I've had work coming in from people that I worked with 10 years ago because you, you remember those relationships and being on LinkedIn and it, LinkedIn is hard but posting being relevant you know having an opinion and having an opinion is hard online because there are people that will disagree with that opinion so yeah. being prepared being prepared for that but yeah, you have to network your arts off can I say arts um, <laughs> <laughs> and get in front of people and remind people who you are and yeah. why you're good and why you're a good cultural fit for them and yeah, you, you'd be amazed at the people that you've come across in the past that remember you know your name yeah you know, meet you for a coffee um so it's do it but but be prepared like you are not going to get a load of sales straight away Mm-hmm. Your first contract may take a couple of months, so make sure you've got enough money saved up in the bank to pay the mortgage, pay the bills, so that you're not panicking. And you know it will come. Yeah, hundred percent come. The work is there. You just have to go and you just have to go and find it. Yeah, but yeah. it's definitely worth the effort. Working for yourself is 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 liberating. It genuinely, genuinely is. It's it's a completely different experience. Yeah. Mm. Great advice. Thank you. Um, so you have a YouTube channel, the Data Protection Diaries. And what prompted you to start that? I nearly got sacked, actually, for having the for having the Data Protection Diaries. So I I'd, I'd, I'd realized um again sort of before the GDPR that I needed a, a personal brand. So if I wanted to leave my job, I needed a brand, I needed people to know who I was to be able to deliver consultancy so i didn't really know linkedin at the time um and i, and I looked around and there wasn't a lot of a lot of information out in the world in, in in terms of data protection so i i filmed a vlog um and it was called a, a day in the life of a data protection officer and i'd gone down to london and i was speaking at an event so i'd, I'd filmed this vlog and i posted it so i'd probably nobody's going to watch it i think it was only watched a, a, a few hundred times and then i thought well there's a lot of misinformation out in the world Mm-hmm. So I do vlogs on explaining things, explaining lawful basis, explaining how to deal with a subject access request. Things that I'd come across in my daily work, I would film a vlog about because I thought that might be interesting for other people. But at the, t- at the time, I was filming it while employed and I was filming it in their offices. I had my work lanyard on and all these sorts of things. And eventually the comms team found out about it and they were like, what are you doing? <laughs> like you've got our brand all over you. You know, you can't yeah. just be filming vlogs and putting on the internet. I'm like, sorry. Um, <laughs> it, 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 just, it just kind of went from there. And, you know, the day, we use the data protection diaries to, to, to just give information 
to people. And, and people say to me, like, you're mad. Like, why are you telling somebody how to do a gap analysis? And it's a, because the people that are watching these videos don't necessarily have the money to, yeah. to have somebody come in. And why should that be a barrier to to good data protection practices? Why should that be a barrier to, to helping a business or to supporting mm -hmm. your your customers and somebody that, that i respect a lot once told me that just because you're telling somebody how to do something doesn't mean that they can do it yeah yeah and and that's what the data protection diaries are about it's about giving knowledge sharing information you know giving people a voice a bit like the networking showing people that you know this is how i do it and a lot of people message me and go thank you so much for posting that I've been stuck on this or I'm going for a job interview and your video on how to build a framework has been, has been brilliant. It's given me insights yeah. into what I can do. Or I've always thought that about HR, you know, processing information for HR purposes, but you've, you've clarified it and you've, and you've made it clear. Like it's a huge help. So it's, it's about giving back and it's also about building a brand, but it's, it's just useful information that why shouldn't it be, why shouldn't it be put out in the world? You know, not everything has to be commoditized. Not everything has to be paid for. Um, yeah. yeah, that's that's why we do it. And, it, and also, I just like talking. <laughs> <laughs> and it just gives me an opportunity to to talk and people don't even have to listen. Yeah, I, I really share your passion uh, about really creating value and giving um, free education and knowledge to people out there. And I think that's one of the reasons why we do this Privacy Pros Academy podcast is because um, we have audiences across over 50 countries now. And most of those countries can't actually, um, it's, it's very unaffordable for them to access the IAPP certification programs uh, to access really high quality European training. But they, we get so many messages, people thanking um, us for putting these together, putting our webinars together and really being grateful. And one thing that I found is the more you share, the more you get back. So yes, we are giving some tips away and, and really helping people to solve these problems for themselves. But you know what? Busy people, busy CEOs, they don't want to do it for themselves. They're like, great, okay, I know what needs to be done, but I haven't got the time to do this. I want to do what I do best. Can you come and take care of that for me? And the more uh, value you put out there, the more valuable you become. Uh, I think the more you're going to start creating and attracting those opportunities to you. And you touched on a few things uh, which I found really interesting, Richard. And these are the things that we teach students on our 12-week Privacy Pro Accelerator. Uh, number one, you spoke about the art of communication, how important it is to have those communication skills. And you also mentioned about having a personal brand. And one of the biggest frustrations that I see in individuals trying to um, get themselves into any kind of uh, industry is they don't have their own personal brand. They might have the competency, they might have the soft skills, but they don't know how to market themselves. And we spend a couple of weeks with our participants just focusing on building up their personal brand how to get their voice on platforms like LinkedIn. And we also get them to deliver value by putting them on a, and making sure they host a webinar where they hear some of the education that they've come across. So people are confident that they know what they're talking about, even though they're so new to the industry as well. So I, I, I completely agree with the values uh, and, and the way you're going about doing things. And I love it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it, it was funny when, I, when we started iStorm, I, I messaged everybody that I'd ever worked with that was of a either worked in IT or compliance was a certain level. It was just like, this is what we do. This is what we're going to do. If you ever need anything, ring me. And I thought that was it. I like, it's done. Like these people now know that we run a consultancy, you know, we can do pen testing, we can do all these things. They're just going to ring me. They're just going to ring me when they need me. Like it's done. And it's like, it's not, you know, it's, it's that constant churn, that constant contact being relevant like you say demonstrating your your knowledge is is so so important and people forget like we're not people are not memorable you know, you're in a sea of information you're in a sea of other people's information and very often when when people come to us it's because we've posted something that just happens to resonate with an issue that they have and it just happened to be posted at the right time so understanding that your personal brand is is about being available and, and being out there and, and talking and sharing information and doing that on a regular basis, I think it's fantastic that you're teaching people because a lot of people don't get that. They just go, well, I've got all these qualifications. Look at my CV. Like, of course, I'm the right person for the job. But that doesn't mean anybody knows who you are. You know, demonstrating your ability to do this role is one of the hardest things because, again, like you don't have sales figures. You don't have 
you know, uh, marketing reach. You, you can't mm-hmm. demonstrate that you've saved people loads of money because you're a good accountant. Like it all comes from from referrals and from people knowing you and, and being able to demonstrate knowledge. And to do that, you have to you know be comfortable putting that content out. You have to be confident like sharing that information so people can see what you do because there's no other way of, of, of them knowing. So yeah, I think it's fantastic that you're that you're training people to do that. Uh, so the last question from me before I give you the chance to ask Jamal anything you'd like, uh, what do you think the data privacy industry will look like in five years or 10 years in the future? I, w- I would like to think in one sense that it looks a bit like the infosec industry um, and the cybersecurity industry. So well-known, respected, busy, um, and and full of really passionate people who you know actually care about what they're doing for a job. You, looking at the if you look at the cybersecurity industry at the minute, the number of people that are that are wanting to get into the industry is is massive. You know, there's there's such a passion out there for technology and and what that means, and that has to be supported by good data protection and good and good privacy practices. Because good tech means more information, more information means more risk, mm-hmm. and there needs to be people there to, to to cover that. So I hope in the next five to ten years that through good training, through we're working with a, with a number of companies on a, on a data protection apprenticeship program, which we hope will be available next year, so people will be able to have a data protection apprentice that will then be able to learn the job and, and, and gain the knowledge through things like the Privacy Pro Accelerator, that we will have an industry of skilled, knowledgeable people um, and the roles will continue to come. And I think this is, look at OneTrust, probably shouldn't say the name, <laughs> a $3 billion company. You know, four years ago, five years ago, PrivTech didn't even exist. And now you've got companies that are able to do that. So the market is there, the desire is there. And I think, you know, the next five years is gonna is gonna see it grow. And I would hope within 10 years that we have a good mature industry that is giving something back to the economy and is doing good for, for consumers and, and people at large. Because you know, let's face it, that's what that's what data protection is all about. It's about mm-hmm. protecting people and helping people to protect themselves. Um so yeah, I would, I would, and then I can retire as well. <laughs> in 10 years, I'd like to retire. We'll add, we'll add that in as well. Great, thank you. Um, and now is your opportunity to ask Jamal anything you'd like. I've got, I've got, I think I've got two questions. I'm just debating, I'm just debating which one to pick. Well, can I ask you two questions? Is that you fair? can have both, Richard, of course right. you can. <laughs> so my, my first question is, how do you see the Privacy Pro Accelerator playing a part in where the industry can be in the next five to 10 years? Like, is it, do you think it's scalable? Like, and do you have targets for, for the number of people that you want to introduce to the industry? That's my first question. All right, so the Privacy Pro Accelerator, um, that is something that I put to them. So the whole idea of that, is you take somebody from where they are now, and that could be with um, little or no previous experience, no legal background, you take them through a 12-week program and they come out uh, ready to be a privacy professional that can operate in any area of the world. And the way uh, I see that contributing is the first thing we do is we really uh, break down their mindset and build it back up again. So some people have self-limiting uh, beliefs, some people have uh, confidence issues because of whatever nurture or nature they've experienced because of some of the way they've been treated in the past. So we really break all of that down and we'll build them back up with the privacy pro mindset. And there's 23 principles that guide me and everything I do when it comes to data privacy. And I really try and embed those principles into the students. Once we've got the right mindset, the next thing we focus on is building up some of those soft skills. So the art of communication, um, having uh, being able to set goals, uh, journaling. So so many soft skills we do as part, as part of them, building them up as um, valuable individuals who value themselves firstly, uh, before they think about anything else. 
once we've got the mindset right, the next thing we focus on is really giving them that education. So we put them through the IAPP, uh, CIPPE program and help them get certified. And whilst they're starting towards a certification, uh, we take a deep dive into each of the different areas that they need to cover to really understand European data protection re legislation. And what we do with that is we take them through all of the modules and we make sure that by the time they move on to the next module, they are a subject matter expert. It's not just someone that knows and might be able to answer one or two questions based on multiple choice, but they can actually go and have a conversation with any peer in the industry and have add value to that and really be able to help people. So once they've got that, now they've got the certification. So they've got the mindset, they've got the certification, they've got the knowledge. The next thing is they don't actually know, they know the theory, but no one can say to them that they know what they're talking about because they've actually done it. So we put them through practical training. So we focus on four key areas, which most businesses uh, and an analyst level will need help with. So how to respond to data subject requests. We give them practical experience and hands-on experience on that. We teach them how to put, um, create records of processing activities, um, how to conduct a data protection impact assessment, how to screen for it, when does it need to happen? Um, so what I've said, ROPA, DSARS, and how to draft privacy notices as well, and the whole transparency obligation. So we give them the practical experience. So now they've got the mindset, they've got the certification, they've got the in-depth subject matter expertise, they've got the practical experience. Now they need help with branding themselves. So my career coaches will come in, they will rewrite their CVs, help them with their LinkedIn profiles, and really put them through a few weeks of training on how to really find their own voice and present value to the world. And during that process, we pick a uh, topic for a webinar, which Jamila produces, and they will come and present and they will teach people um, for free and they will really share some of the education and knowledge. And usually we do it for the third sector, the not-for-profit sector. And it's yeah. something that we do as part of giving back and we give them the opportunity to come and learn uh, how to manage their programs. Um, sometimes they can't access because of budget constraints. But it also demonstrates to the individuals on our program, our mentees, that you know what, you are now a person that can actually contribute value you're able to handle questions, you know exactly what you're talking about, and you're ready to go out in the world and become a world-class privacy profession. So the more important question, who's your favourite guest? <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to ask me that in two years' time, Richard. Oh, come on. I, I, I've, I've, every, every single guest I've spoken to has something very unique um, to contribute. And the thing is, um, Jamila has actually approached you to um, come and be a guest. And we, we, we actually have a list of people that we want to bring on and speak and Jamila reaches out to them. So we love the, what you're doing. We love your values. We love all the stuff you're putting okay. out. And all of the guests that we bring on, we value each guest. We love what they're doing. We feel there's a synergy. And that's why we invite them on. So I can't say I have a favorite <laughs> guest, but if you ask me two years later, I'll tell you my favorite interview. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you that. I'll take that. No, I think I think what you're doing is 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 brilliant. I, you know, I, I think the accelerator program is very clever. Is very clever. I think these podcasts, uh, you know, are, are brilliant. I think giving people a voice is is so important because it it allows us to to show the world that we you know we we are human beings. You know, we're not we're not stuffy. We're not boring. <laughs> Everyone is different. Everyone you'll speak to will, will be different. Everybody has a different viewpoint on why they do the role, how they do the role. And you know, I think this kind of podcast just helps to, to to push that out to the wider world. And if that encourages one person to come into the industry, you know, then you know we've all done a good job. So, no, well done. I'm, I'm pleased to be on here. Thank you for having me. No, we've really enjoyed having you on. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Yeah, it's uh, it's been our privilege and an honour, Richard. Thank you.